Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bethany Baptist Church. It's a great joy and privilege and blessing to be able to join together this morning to fellowship and worship our God. Um, if you're a guest with us this morning, um, welcome. Hope you join in worship with us. Um, sing, pray, uh, respond to God's word. Our restrooms are down the hall to your right. Um, covenant members, if you remember, our, our uh, tithings, offerings are in the given in the boxes on the way out. Um, this morning, as our custom is, at the beginning of the service, we usually do a call to worship. If you're anything like me, often you might rush into God's presence. It's easy to do, just to start praying or singing without thinking about the weight of what we're doing. Entering in the presence of God Almighty, the creator of the world. So, that's our call to worship is to help us in that some, in some ways. This morning, um, you should ask yourself, why, why are you able to? to enter into God's presence, or are you able? If you follow the church's reading plan, this week you read about the Day of Atonement, where for the people of God in the Old Testament, one day a year, only one person was allowed into the symbolic presence of God, and not with his own good, but only with blood. And on that day, he confessed the sins of his own sins and for all the people over the lamb, over the goat, the scapegoat. Um, so for us to enter in the Holy of Holies, we must put our hands on the lamb. It's his blood, the reason we get to enter in. I'm going to read from Hebrews Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let's draw near this morning in full confidence in God's presence. Let's pray together. God most high, may we not rush into your presence this morning without thinking, without considering your holiness. We read of Aaron's sons, God, who rushed in, not with blood, and they were struck dead because of their unholiness. So we come this morning only through Christ. For we have not been good enough this week to enter your presence on our own. We will be struck dead just like Aaron and his sons. We lay hold of Christ again by faith this morning. We confess again all our shortcomings of the week. not loved you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, God. We have not loved our neighbor as ourself. We have not fulfilled the law. But you've made a new and living way. And we are to draw near in confidence. Because Christ has been offered for us. So we plead his blood this morning, God. 
and by it we are fully accepted into the holy of holies. We have fellowship with you and with each other. God, grant us greater faith to cast off our self-righteousness, to lay hold of Christ by faith, to rest securely in the gospel, to believe in our acceptance because of him alone. God, bless our gathering this morning. We pray for divine aid and help in worship as these songs will not just be on our lips, praise would be in our hearts and as we sit under your word God grant us humility grant us uh, a teachable heart may Christ be glorified here among us today we pray in his name amen let's stand together we're going to sing be thou my vision a prayer to God
continue our scripture reading, I mean our scripture memory this morning from Romans chapter 8. I believe we memorized Romans 8 verse 5 this week. Let's try to say it together. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. Let's sing hymn 280 in the red hymnal. Hymn 280, redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Good morning. Today I'm going to be reading out of the ESV uh, version. We're going to be in Proverbs chapter 1 um, and verses 20 to the end of the chapter. Uh, This is the call of wisdom. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the markets, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gate, she speaks. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called and you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. Because you have ignored all my counsel, and would have none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you, when terror strikes you like a storm, and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel, and despised all my reproof. Therefore, 
they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. Let's let these words of Proverbs inform our prayers. Pray with me. God, we call upon you for wisdom, the giver of it, the source and the fountain of all knowledge. God, we do not want to be simple. God, we do not want to be like the fool. But God, we ask you to give us wisdom. God, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge and understanding. So we look to you rightly, to see you rightly in your place as ruler of all. God, we are not on the throne, but we see that you are on the throne. And God, as we encounter culture, as we encounter the world, as we encounter one another here in Albertson, God, we need your wisdom to know how to speak, when to speak, what to say. So God, we do not lean on our own strength. God, even as we worship you, we ask for wisdom. We ask that you would be with us as we speak to one another, that we would not uh, be quick to anger, but that we would love our neighbors. God, wisdom sets us apart from the world. Um, We might be yelling wisdom when the world might hate us for it, but God, will we not then shy away from it, but will we dig in and ask for more? Your steadfast love endures forever. So you will continue to supply us with wisdom. We need only ask, God. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing one of our family worship songs from last year, Psalm 145. The song is about the steadfast love of the Lord. Think, where can you put your finger on the last week, month, evidence of the steadfast love of the Lord for you? Let that fuel your singing, your joy. Psalm 145. The Lord is faithful.
song we learned last week, the servant song. So we're thinking about those who lead our church, what that looks like. And even as you think about your brother or sisters around you, let those people come to your mind as we sing, serving one another. If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, will you turn to the book of Titus for the last time this morning? Titus chapter 1. We'll be examining each of these words in this verse. So if you didn't bring your own copy of God's Word, I'd invite you to grab a Bible, the black book in the pew rack in front of you or behind you. And you can turn to page 998. 998 will be in Titus chapter 1. I'm going to read all. Uh, Verse 5 through 9, but our sermon will be coming from verse 9 specifically this morning. Titus chapter 1, verse 5. So if you found uh, those words in your copy of the Bible and you're willing and also able, would you stand out of reverence for the reading of God's word? Titus chapter 1, verse 5 says to all of us who have ears to hear this morning. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick tempered or a drunkard. Or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. And now verse 9. 
An elder must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Thank you, and you may have your seats. This is the third and final part in our series. My proposal as your appointed elder, pastor, my desire for us to conform our leadership model more to the biblical one that I have been putting before you for the last three weeks and hope to continue to remind you in the coming years. Do you know what the leadership structure of the church you are sitting in is? Do you know what the leadership structure is? Do you care? Do you care about leadership? Do you care about the structure? You should. Paul cared so much that he wrote a couple of letters just dealing with this. Currently, the model of church leadership at Bethany Baptist Church is one singular pastor or elder and a plurality of deacons, eight or nine of those. But the biblical model consistently in the New Testament is for each church to not have one elder pastor, but multiple elders, also called bishops, overseers, shepherds or pastors, and a plurality of elders. So my proposal is that we consider the biblical model, consider the benefits and the need to transition someday to not just one elder pastor, but a plurality of shepherds overseeing our souls in this way. So the first week, for Titus chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, we looked at where do elders come from? Where is this idea? It's, it's foreign to our church, many Baptist churches. Where did it come from? Where did it originate? Why should we have elders? And then last week we looked at who elders are. Are. We talked about we need them. Then we looked at what kind of people are they? What kind of character traits? Men above reproach, not perfect, but modeling godliness to us. Not just when we see them on Sunday mornings, but if we were to pop into their workplace, into their home, into their car on the way to and from church. And now, lastly and perhaps most importantly, we ought to want to know what will they actually do? This morning's sermon title is, What Do Elders Do? That is, what is their job task? What can we expect they did in biblical New Testament times? And what would they possibly do here? The first thing, what do elders do? It is this. I get this from verse 9, the first clause. What do elders do? Elders, plural, these leaders in our church will be men who hold Firm to the word of God. Look at the first clause in verse 9. He, speaking of one of the many elders, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. If an elder does not do this, I do not care how good he is at giving instruction or teaching. If he does not first do this, I do not care to hear any rebukes or guarding a doctrine. This is the first thing An elder will do. But friends, not just elders. All of you in Christ, outside of Christ, should hold firm to the word. So that if an elder is preaching, you will recognize it. Or if they are contradicting the word you've been holding so fast at home, you're able to tell them, no, that's not the word of God. You're preaching Lucas. That's not Christ. Must hold firm to the trustworthy word is taught. An illustration might be like this. It might be like a man in a, in a foreign village in which there is no good, pure water. All of the water has been poisoned. It is stagnant. It makes people sick. But then he discovers, he digs and he finds a well of pure water that can save him and the entire village. And he finds that water and he drinks that water. He plants his house, his hut next to that water. And he lives to help others find that pure water. An elder, like a Christian, is a man who's found that water. Pure, life-giving 
water. So what is this? It's not just water. That's an illustration. That's a parable. Verse 9, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. There is an object. There is a source document of wisdom that the world does not have on its own, but has been divinely given. The special revelation we call this God's word, the Holy Bible contained in 66 books. Many of you are holding firm to that word right now. But do you all weep? It's every decision made from that book, that word. It's the trustworthy word as taught, not to be taught with new revelation coming forward, but it has been received. Jude says to contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. It's here. It's here. I don't need to know what they're doing in Hollywood. I don't need to know what they're doing on Wall Street. The way to run the church, the truth, the water is here in your hands. This is is the trustworthy word as taught. So is this the word that the elders in the New Testament taught? Is this where they went first? Yes. Yes, turn with me. We're going to go on a quick journey to see the plurality of elders holding fast to the trustworthy word as taught. Turn to your left, Acts chapter 15. There's trouble going on in the community, trouble going on in the village, false gospels, watered down gospels, poison gospels. And so the elders gather and what do they go to? Look at Acts chapter 15, verse one. It says, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers lie. Unless you are circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So what do the elders do? What do the leaders of the church do? Verse 2. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others who were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. We have trouble in the village. We have a doctrinal question that needs to be answered. And where do they go? Flip over to Acts chapter 15, verse 15. They talk, they pray, and they go to the word of God that is once and for all entrusted to the saints. Look at Acts chapter 15, verse 15. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. And they quote scripture. They go there. They hold firm to the word of God. This is how they will know what decisions to make in leading God's people in guarding their own souls. That's not enough. Turn to Acts chapter 20. How shall we be led? What shall we hold firm to? Look at Acts chapter 20, verse 17. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the who? One elder? Lucas? No, the elders of the church to come to him. So they gather. How, how, will they, how will they make a decision? Look at Acts chapter 20, verse 26. What does he tell them that he did as an elder? What is he commending them to do as elders that will keep the church strong in Albert and keep the strong church in Crete? Look at Acts chapter 20, verse 26. Paul says, what did he do? What was it that he was holding firm to? Verse 26. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of you all. For I did not shrink from declaring you the whole counsel of of God. The word, the trustworthy word is taught. This is what elders at Bethany Baptist Church must hold firm to. This must be what they teach. And then turn back to Titus where we began Titus chapter one. But I want you to look at verse one. Paul, you're telling Titus he needs to hold fast to the word and elders will hold fast to the word. Is that what you did, Paul? Did you practice what you preached? Paul, a great elder here. Titus chapter one. Look at where his truth is comes from Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness and hope of eternal life, which God who never lies. Oh, he doesn't. He promised beforehand, before the ages began at the proper time manifested in his in his word, to the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God. He says, I hold to the word and I preach to the word. You hold to the word and preach to the word. And appoint men, elders, plural, who hold fast to the word. Do you hold firm to this word? Do you hold firm to it? Luther was called this kind of man in Latin. Homo unius libri. Do you know what this means? A man of one book. Master this book. Don't just have it. Yeah, we believe the Bible and we close and it sits over here in our coffee table or in our church. 
But one book holding firm to it, holding firm. This is all we have. This is all we need. And God has said, this is how we will know him and know his will for us in the church. So how can you grow in this? Or men who aspire to be elders. And maybe you don't feel like you could be an elder yet, but you want to. How, how should you prepare? Friends, put down your magazines. Put down all the other books that you know so well. Turn off the TV. Pick up this book and saturate your life with it. Hold firm. Surely you could hold more firm to it. Surely you could know it more. Elders at Bethany Baptist Church are going to be men who do not just get in the Word one day or two days a week, but they're in it every day. Every day. Saturated with it. It was said of John Bunyan that if you cut him, he bled the Bible. It bled Biblin. Every day. But, but not just that. Not just your favorite passages. Read it from cover to cover. Know the full counsel of God. Not just your hobby horses or your favorite verses. Know them in context. Biblical elders will be those who have the whole Bible at their fingertips. And are trying to dig in more. And they know not just from beginning to end. They know the story. They know the main point of it. That the point is redemption in Christ. Not rules and politics. They know the story. They know what it's all about. And if they don't know it all, they're wanting more of it. They want the big picture. Friends, or is your thoughts about the Bible like this? My children, we want them to read the Bible with us every night in our home. They see us read it in the morning as a married couple, and we read it with them at night. Now, as they're young and they're getting older, most of what family worship or Bible reading consists of is not actually getting to explain what the text says, but just getting them to sit still. So any of you who are trying to start family worship, it is hard. I would say the first eight years has mostly been this. Sit down. Don't touch your brother. Don't talk. Shh. Don't talk. Sit still. Just so that somehow, someday, they might actually be able to sit still long enough without talking to hear and understand the message. But remember one time recently asking one of my children, I said, hey, son, what do you think the Bible says? And you know what my son told me? Daddy, the Bible says don't talk, don't talk. (laughs) Is that all you think the Bible says? It's just a list of don'ts and do's and rules And boundaries and clean and unclean friends. The Bible does not just say don't talk. When he talks about the trustworthy word is tight. It doesn't just mean you have the Bible and you know the Bible. The chief end, the main message as Jesus showed the disciples. All of these texts point to Jesus. This is the great thing we are trying to put before people. Week in and week out. Do you know That message, friend, it's a trustworthy word as taught. Do you not know, friends, you might think the Bible is archaic. You might think it's silly. The apostles, the elders, they died for this. They believe this gospel so much that they're willing to die for it. The gospel of Jesus Christ. And you have it in your hands taught and received because of their sacrifice. Friends, I need to grow in this. I am an elder, but I have much to grow in. I preach too much Lucas. I preach too much rules. I preach too much regulations. Don't talk, don't touch, sit still. I need to grow in this. But the trustworthy word is taught is the doctrine of Christ. Christ crucified. I need to grow in this. Men, women out there, we need to grow in how we understand the Bible. It's main need. This is why I need a plurality of elders to rebuke me, to do better at modeling more of Christ, more of the Lamb slain to whom we imagine our sins being put on Him and the scapegoat exiting the land. Friends, ask yourself, what are you holding to? He says, this is what elders, this is what the people will do. They will hold firm to the trust where the word is taught. What are you holding firm to? Is it your own wisdom? Children, you are not born wise. The Bible says you were born simple fools. We all were. Are you holding on to your own opinions, the own lust of your flesh, what your friends tell you at school? What are you holding firm to? Hold firm to this. This. The word of Christ. What is your word? So what do elders do? They hold fast to the word of God. Second thing, what do elders do? What will elders do at Bethany Baptist Church? 
Elders will give instruction from this book. They will be teachers. They will be able to teach. I get this from the second clause, the first half of it in verse 9. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. That's the same book. That's the same message. Able to teach. So what are elders going to do at Bethany Baptist Church? They're going to be those, plural, who help with leading and teaching others from this book. So remember the person who found the water, who found the water in the village and it's become abundant life welling up in them and they drink there. What else do they do? They invite everyone else to come to this water. They know the path of the map to this water. They know what it felt like to taste it on their lips first. And they keep drinking of it. So what do they teach? The water. The water of this well. The water of Christ. Leading others there. Now, we need to. This is probably the hardest part about understanding elders. When I say elders, we have a singular elder, plurality of deacons. We're wanting a plurality of elders and a plurality of deacons. Elders and deacons are different god Given offices of the church. So this is the main difference between an elder and a deacon. They should all desire to be equally godly and equally necessary. Deacons, are you listening? But the main difference between an elder and a deacon is that an elder must be able to teach and will teach. Will be in positions of leadership from the word of God. Attending to the spiritual needs of the church. Turn to Acts chapter 6. This is where we see the office of deacon born in the New Testament scene. And the contrast of that between elders and deacons. Elders will be those who lead in the word. Deacons will not do this. That's not what deacons do. Deacons are given a great task. But it is not to be teachers and leaders in this way. Look at Acts chapter 6. This is the beginning of the deacon ministry. We'll see it in contrast to elders. It says in Acts chapter 6 verse 1, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So people not getting fed. Physical food. Bread. Verse 2. And the twelve apostles... Summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit. So they're still godly. They're still qualified. Wisdom, whom we will appoint to this distinct duty. Verse four. But we, the elders with apostles who would foreshadow elders, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of Of the word. Do you see deacons serving tables, administering the physical needs of the church, elders, as the apostles here, attending to the spiritual needs, chiefly praying and teaching and administering the word? Turn to Timothy, 1 Timothy to your right, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. This is where we see the main distinction between elders, overseers, versus deacons and servants in this way. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 2. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 is on page 992 if you're using the good Bible. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, and there it is, able to teach. That's the main difference between elders at Bethany, elders in the church, and deacons. Both qualified, godly men, models of godliness, but the main distinction here is Teaching, And then look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. We see what the plural elders are going to do. Chapter 5, verse 17. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Plural elders leading, shepherding, preaching, and teaching. Paul, you told Titus to do this. What does that look like? Turn back to Titus chapter 2, verse 1. I need to show you need to build a biblical case that we need this in our church. What would elders do? Titus, like a good elder to an aspiring younger elder, says this in Titus chapter 2, verse 1. As for you, elders at Bethany Baptist Church, this is what you will do. Teach what accords with sound doctrine. Teach. Teach. How about some better illustrations? We've looked at scripture. How about this? If our church was a restaurant... The chefs that serve up the great pastries and the good meat and potatoes. The chefs are the elders. But those necessary, not to be overlooked servers who take the food to the table and make sure everybody's getting it. Those are deacons. You need both. 
And aren't you wanting to be fed? Aren't you hungry? Don't you want a, a great place to eat and to bring your family and to bring your friends? Or consider this illustration. We're going to drive the bus later today to visit some of our shut-ins, which is kind of like a deacon ministry. The bus drivers are the elders. Following Christ, they determine the direction and they plan how to get there. The deacons are those who make sure the bus is full of gas so it can actually get there. Elders. Deacons. And here's one from a personal life. I was doing evangelism in Hopkinsville. We were going door to door in the middle of the summer. Me, an elder, and another elder at our church, Pastor Daryl, we were doing evangelism together. And we were going door to door, and we came to a man who was not in his house, who was mowing the grass out front. And it didn't look like this guy was going to stop and talk to us, right? Because what he had to get his grass cut. So I looked at Daryl. I looked at myself. I knew that Daryl was a far more gifted elder and evangelist. And I used to mow grass for a living. So in order for this man to be able to hear the gospel, I said, I'll finish mowing your grass. And I grabbed the mower and I push mowed as an associate pastor at, at Living Hope Baptist Church for the next 20 minutes. So that man was free to talk to Pastor Daryl, who knows the gospel better, is an excellent evangelist. I was deaconing. He was eldering. Both are needed in our community. Both are needed in our church. Here's how it might look practical. At Bethany Baptist Church, if we're going to plan a potluck meal, we need deacons to make sure we got enough food, the lights are on, that the chairs are comfortable. But if I'm going to plan the next teaching series, what book of the Bible I should go through, what vision we need, I'm going to gather elders. If we're going to have a baptism, somebody's going to be baptized soon. Maybe. I need to make sure that the water... Holds in the tub and that it's clean, that there's towels and that everything's set up. Deacons are going to do that. But if there's going to be a baptism interview to see if this person really understands the gospel and, and they're tracking with us, it's going to be elders in that conversation. What about if we're going to, uh, if, if we need to take money to make sure we have enough money to purchase Sunday school literature for our Sunday school classes? We need deacons to help that and to pass them out, make sure everybody's got the material and it's ready there and waiting for them. But if we're going to decide which teachers should be teaching Sunday school class and which curriculum we should buy, the elders ought to do that. If we're going to decide next week because of all the snow we're going to get, and we need to decide if the parking lot's going to be safe enough, if we should have church, I'm going to call the deacons. And I did this week. I called Brother Ricky Patterson, a good deacon, and said, do you think we should have church or not? But if I'm going to decide or we're going to decide, is it a good Sunday to take communion? Is it the right time for our church? I'm going to ask the elders, the men who lead in the spiritual matters of praying, preaching and teaching. If we're going to have a meeting about if we should purchase a new playground, will it work? How much would it cost? What would be safe? I'm going to call the deacons. But if there needs to be a confrontation, private church discipline, I'm going to call the elders. I think that's the biblical model here. What are the roles of deacons? What are the roles of elders? They're both good. They're both needed. Our church cannot go on without elders. And we would not be able to go on without godly deacons. So look at the text again. First, first or Titus chapter 1, verse 9. It says he must hold firm to the trust where the word is taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. So again, if you're going to be able to be a good teacher, if we're going to have good elders, they first got to know the word. They've got to be resting in the word. When you teach in our classes, when you teach us, don't give us anything if you don't have the words. So they must be able to have the word in order to be able to teach. But does it say that they're going to be awesome preachers? That they're all going to be gifted in the exact same kind of teaching? No, just able to teach. So that's important. Some of our elders are going to be better right here preaching. And some of the elders are going to be far greater than I am in a small group setting, in one-on-one -on -one discipleship, in having marriage counseling with couples that I have a hard time uh, being able to give the word carefully because I haven't been married this long. You see that they will be able to teach. It might be from this pulpit. It might be in a Sunday school class. It might be in private counseling. Not everybody's going to be gifted in the same as preaching. It's like some are not gifted in other forms of Teaching. Some might be fully supported by our church. Some might be partly supported. Many might be lay leaders who do it on their own time, but serve and lead the church 
Well, friends, I need to grow in teaching. We need to pour out of elders because I'm not all that good at teaching all the time. It was so good to sit in my house and take care of my wife and hear Jordan's sermon on replay. You know why? Because this preacher talks too fast. Do you see what I'm saying right now when I say that? (laughs) You do, don't you? I need to be able to teach more clearly, more slowly, more carefully. Yes, amen to that. When I heard Jordan preach, I got what you all been telling me for the last five years. Like, oh, that part where you can take a breath and you can process what he just said. I need to grow in my teaching. We need a plurality of elders. We need multiple teachers. We do. Friends, what are you teaching others? What kind of teaching are you listening to each week throughout your week. What do elders do? Remember, what do they do? They give instruction from the word. All right, third and lastly, what do elders do? I get this from the rest of verse 9. Read it with me. It says, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. They're able to rebuke those who contradict it. So what else are elders going to do at Bethany Baptist Church? They're not just going to hold the word and give the word. They're going to guard the word. They're going to rebuke those who contradict it from the pulpit in counseling, one on one within our sheep when they're suffering from false teaching. Not only giving the good Guarding from the bad. This would be like the man who found the well in the village, discovered this pure water, and he's satisfied by it. He knows it, he knows the way, and he invites others down the map and shows them this water. But he hears that there are other people saying to keep drinking the bad water that's killing everyone and making them sick. And he says, no, not only do I have the water, don't go to that water. Don't go to that church. Don't listen to that false teacher. Don't believe that lie that Satan is telling you. And then in the well that they found the truth that they guard at that church, they won't let anyone come in and poison that well and ruin it for everyone else. They won't. So they say, stop. They say, no, that's not of Christ. It contradicts the word of God. I know it because I know the word of God I've been teaching. You're contradicting. I love you. But back up. So rebuke is not just stop and retributive, but they're... For reconciling, to restore you. I'm telling you this is wrong because I want you to be restored to the truth. I I don't just want you to stop selling bad water and poisoning our water. I want you also to know the good water, to know the truth. We rebuke because we love those who contradict the true word. We rebuke. So what would be an example of rebuke? And and rebuke is not just something that elders are going to do. We ought to be rebuking one another. You, You want me to give you an illustration of this? When God saved Brent Westbrook, one of our first times sitting down to read the Bible together, I'm the teacher, I'm the older Christian, and I'm teaching him, but Brent loved me enough to rebuke me. I'll never forget it. He said, you just said this word, and I think that that word is vulgar, and you shouldn't say it. We all need to be rebuking one another. I need Brent's in my life. You need Brent's in your life. We need to rebuke Brent. Brent needs to rebuke us. And on and on and on. We need this. Don't assume you know everything. We need to constantly be corrected. We need to know what the good water is and what the bad water is and not allow poison to get in there. I think of Tommy Woodall when I was in college and we were playing volleyball and saying volleyball is what you did when you didn't have a wife, you didn't have children, you didn't have much responsibility. Oh, those times are so far behind me. We play saying volleyball and there was another guy on our team and he was not very good and I just started cutting him down. I won't say his name. Because that would also maybe be not friendly and be cutting down. I was making fun of him. Come on, man. And just mocking him. And Tommy Woodall, who I bet would be a good elder someday, looked at me and said, Lucas, cut it out. What are you doing? Don't treat our teammates that way. Cut it out. I need that rebuke. We need those rebukes. We're belittling others and not showing compassion, thinking we're better than they are. So rebuking is telling someone, this is the truth. What you're saying is false. Stop that. I love you. What is not rebuking? It's watching someone suffer, watch someone in sin and not saying anything. In my experience with elders at the churches I've been a part of, this was their great weakness. They were good at knowing the Bible. They were good at instructing it, but they were too cowardly to rebuke those who were causing trouble in the church. It takes courage of Christ. It takes not caring if you're going to offend someone. 
Because you love the sheep. I would say this is going to be one of the greatest weaknesses likely in some of the godly men here is that they're afraid to rebuke. I need it. In fact, I'm looking for men like this. We're looking for men like this. It's going to be the men that are not afraid to rebuke me. Not just in anger, but with the word of God. Look, as you said this, here's what's going on. I hear about it happening in the congregation. I need this. I have been rebuked. I gave you an example of two right there and many more. I need it. We need these kind of elders. I, I remember my sister before she came to high school. I was a sophomore, going to be a junior. And there was this guy named Andrew. That's his real name. <laughs> this is a bad example. And he was a pervert. He was a punk, and I saw the way he treated girls. And long before my sister graduated from middle school and came to high school, I had dreams of him coming down through the locker rooms and trying to engage my sister in his perversion. You know what I did in those dreams? I rose up and beat him off of my sister, and I said, get back. Got to be men like that who guard the sheep from perversion when our sister's actually there and Andrew's actually Roman the hallways. We need a plurality of elders. Friends, I think I probably err on the rebuking too much, but I think that when I reflect, I, I do love people and sometimes to a fault, I don't want to tell them that what they just said was wrong and I want to be too kind. I'm not as brave as you think I am. I fear man and I'm scared sometimes and out of self-preservation, I don't rebuke. I didn't stop things before they got out of hand. And so what does that prove already? I need help. I need other elders who are going to help me and rebuke. So it's not just Lucas being the bad guy all the time. Not just Lucas finally standing up. When will the men of God stand up? To help keep the water from being poisoned. And to love the sheep so that they can drink, drink, drink of the pure water. Friend, an elder will, will preach clearly the gospel. And he will warn those who contradict it. Everyone out there this morning, do you know the gospel? Do you know that God made us good to know Him and enjoy Him forever? But we have sinned. Every one of you has sinned. You've sinned. And you've sinned against a holy God. And the wages of sin is death. Presently, complications of life and eternal judgment and wrath. That's what we deserve. But God in His mercy, He's so rich in mercy. Through this elder right now, I'm not domineering it over you, but I'm trying to serve up the gospel for you. Here's the food that God sent His own Son. Fully God and fully man. He fulfilled the law perfectly. And then on the cross, God chose to put the wrath that was deserved for His people on His own Son. And He died an excruciating, painful death on the cross. He rose three days later to show that God had accepted this atonement, that they had been working together from the foundation of the world, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, to restore a people to Himself, that their sins would not be counted against them, but to Himself, and His righteousness would be given to Him. That's the gospel. But here's what a good elder does too. Friends, if you're out there this morning, and you have not repented and put your faith in Christ, let me rebuke you out of love. You're going to go to hell. You're going to children. You, you've heard the gospel. You know the Bible says more than just don't talk, don't talk. But hear it and repent. The most loving thing I can do to you is to say if you're outside of Christ, run to Him. What would keep you from coming to a God like this? Who has loved you ere you have ever loved Him. But all those outside of Christ and who preach outside of Christ, their condemnation is just. You see, we give the truth. Also give rebukes. And my great desire is not just for you to believe in elders or to be a member of our church, but for everyone to turn from their sins. Everyone in the vestibule, turn and run to the great elder, the great elder brother, the great shepherd who laid down his life to redeem a people for himself. What do elders do? Elders hold firm to the word. Elders give instruction from the word. And they rebuke and love those who contradict it. And so we're going to end with this. When we have biblical elders, Lord willing, and with your will, elders will not rule it over the church. It's not a decision that I make and we do. Elders merely lead and the congregation rules and affirms. So the call for this morning is not just for elders, but for the church to arise. To hear the call of the great captain and follow him in obedience for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of our village, for the sake of the water that leads to eternal life. Church, this is on you. Let's pray.
Father, for your glory, stir up affections for your Son. Preaching of the truth that accords with godliness, even godliness in the way we run your church. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church Arise, 663, in the hymn book. You guys could have a seat for just just a minute or two. Part of being a church, covenanting members, is that in shepherding we uh, interview and get to know those who would want to be a part of the flock, make sure we agree upon the sound doctrine of the word, the gospel, the essentials of the faith, and rebuke or keep out those who would contradict it, as far as we can tell. Uh, So this morning with joy, I'm going to be recommending to you for membership, David and Shannon Marshall. Uh, Been able to meet with them a couple times in group settings and uh, lunch. Had them over to our house yesterday for about four hours of good time, very good time. We ate and talked about um, our statement of faith. We walked through all, every one of the articles in our statement of faith, what we believe about God, the Trinity, uh, the Holy Spirit. Uh, the ordinances of baptism, Lord's Supper, all these things, they're in agreement with that. 
and uh, went through our church constitution and bylaws, talked about those things, and then lastly, the church covenant. Uh, I heard both of their testimonies. Um, they are uh, just retired from serving our country, uh, David, on border patrol for our government in Texas, and then ended before retirement as a chaplain, uh, ministering to others in the gospel of Christ before that, and um, Miss Shana beside him doing that in a pastry chef. Listen, we talk about gifts of the Spirit that we're excited about coming to our church. <laughs> That's a good gift to be able to cook uh, and, and great at it. We've already been um, blessed by that. But they would be joining us from Mount Hope Baptist Church in Ashburn, Virginia. They've just retired here, bought a house in the Alberton area um, because they have family here. So I heard their testimonies. Both gave a good understanding of the gospel, both of them in their own words. Um, just so you know, Shannon, uh, and, and this is important too, both of them are pastor's kids, preacher's kids. They both grew up in the church. Be warned. <laughs> Be warned, that's right. So we already have this connection, and I know our children will with them too, but uh, Shannon was saved at age four. She believes that God supernaturally saved her, even at that young age, um, but because they were being careful at that church, she was not later baptized until age 12, just to, just to be careful and not be hasty and laying on of hands there. Uh, has walked with the Lord since. David, also at a young age, uh, baptized and professed faith at age seven, but had some years of wandering away from the Lord. And so um, just to, uh, to kind of visualize his coming back to the Lord and perhaps maybe being reborn for the first time, rededicating his life, he was baptized around age 18, um, uh, also by immersion. So um, I've met with these folks. Some of you have already got to know them. Um, but as an elder, the elder at our church this morning, I strongly recommend them to you, covenant members for membership. Is there a second out there? All right, Chuck and Nelson. Are there any questions for them or for me on their behalf uh, about what they believe or about church membership here at Bethany Baptist Church? Any questions? We take it seriously here, don't we? Because we love the church family. And we love the gospel. All right. Uh, all those in favor, if you're a member of affirming them into our church covenant, would you say amen? amen. All right. And any opposed? Just say no. All right. It sounds like you're a part of the church family officially. We love you guys. We're thankful to have you. So I'm going to read your benediction. If you'd like to give them the right hand of fellowship and welcome them, or the right elbow fist bump, right, as appropriate. Um, uh, come, come meet them out back. I'll be adding them to our church directory. We'll have their picture out there. If I could get maybe Christy or Toby to take a picture of them before I forget on the way out, we'll have a picture for, for them, their address, and they'll be a part of the email and uh, church covenant there. So let's read about God and his shepherds, about uh, bad elders and good elders. From Jeremiah chapter 23 is our benediction. It's from Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 1 through 4, it says this. This is your God speaking. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away and you have not attended to them. Hold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then, then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and I will bring them back to their fold and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed and neither shall be any missing, declares the Lord God. Amen. You are dismissed.